Hello and welcome back to MLab 1231, Parasitology and Mycology. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the last of our three-part presentation on the class Cestota, the tapeworms. The first two species of tapeworm we're going to discuss are Tinea saginata, known as the beef tapeworm, and Tinea solium, known as the pork tapeworm. The beef tapeworm, Tinea saginata, is found worldwide and seen most commonly in beef-eating countries, while Tinea solium is also seen worldwide and naturally seen in pork-eating countries, but not often found in the United States. Humans are the only definitive host for these two species. The morphology of Tinea saginata worm is, includes a scolex that is unarmed with no hooks, unarmed meaning it has no hooks, and it contains four sucking discs. The gravid proglottids of each proglottid has 15 to 30 uterine branches, and the eggs measure approximately 40 microns. Tinea solium has an adult worm scolex that is armed, meaning it does have hooks, and also contains four sucking discs. The gravid proglottids of Tinea solium have 7 to 13 uterine branches in each proglottid, so quite a bit fewer than Tinea saginata. And the egg of Tinea solium is also approximately 40 microns which make it hard to distinguish, if not impossible, to distinguish from Tinea saginata. So, one of the distinguishing characteristics between the two species is the number of uterine branches between, found in each proglottid. On the left here, we have Tinea saginata with 15 to 30 uterine branches in each proglottid, while on the right, we have a proglottid section of Tinea solium, which has 7 to 13 uterine branches, so quite a bit fewer. The life cycle of the Tinea species begins when eggs are passed in the feces of infected humans, which can survive for days, if not months, in the environment. When along comes cows and pigs, which ingest those gravid proglottids uh, from fecally contaminated vegetation. Once ingested, those oncospheres hatch in the animal's intestines, where they then cross the intestinal wall and migrate to striated muscle. Once there, the oncospheres developed into cystocerci in the striated muscle of the infected cow or pig. The definitive host, the human, becomes infected after ingesting meat from undercooked beef or pork. The cystocercois, once ingested, then develops over the next two to few months in the intestine of the infected human. Once that two-month maturation process is complete, the adult tapeworm can survive for years. The adult worm attaches to the wall of the small intestine where they then produce gravid proglottids that detach and are passed in the feces to infect vegetation, which is then consumed by cows and pigs. Pathology of tinea infection can be asymptomatic with light infection or it can include abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, or eosinophilia with heavier infection. A serious complication of tinea solium infection is something called neurocystosarcosis. Uh, it is only an infection, uh, is, it is only a complication of tinea solium, and it occurs when humans serve as an accidental intermediate host. Symptoms of neurocystocercosis includes headache, epilepsy, palpedema, vomiting, 
and can be fatal if racemose develops in the brain. That's one of the vocabulary terms we discussed in the first of this three-part presentation. Uh, this occurs when eggs are ingested or released from the proglottid in the intestinal tract, and th those eggs then hatch in the intestine where the larvae migrate to form cystocercus bladders in the nervous tissue, causing neurocystocercosis. Uh, humans are the only definitive host, again, for tinea solium and tinea saginata. Uh, just to give you a perspective of how many eggs we're talking about here with one infection, tinea solium averages 1,000 proglottids, with, e with each proglottid averaging 50,000 eggs. Tinea saginata range anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 proglottids, with each of those proglottids producing about 100,000 eggs, so quite a large number from one worm. Our next organism is Diphylobotrium latum, which is known as the fish or broad tapeworm. It is geographically distributed uh, in temperate climates in areas of high fresh fish water consumption. This includes areas such as the Great Lakes region in the United States, uh, Alaska, Chile, Argentina, Central Africa, and other parts of Africa as some of the most prominent areas for Diphylobothrium latum infection. The egg measures 30 to 60 microns and contains an operculum, which is one of the only cestodes to uh, include an operculum, and the worm averages 15 meters or more with a scolex that is almond-shaped with a pair sucking grooves known as a bothria. They average 3,000 proglottids because of its great size. It is capable of producing quite a large number of eggs. The life cycle of the Phylobothrium latum includes two intermediate hosts. An infection begins when immature eggs are passed in the feces of infected humans. Those eggs then mature over the next 18 to 20 days into oncospheres, which develop into uh, Corsidia. The intermediate host, the first of two intermediate hosts, is the freshwater crustacean, which ingests that Corsidia. The Corsidia then develop into Pericercoid larvae. And then comes the second intermediate host, which is a small freshwater fish like a minnow or other freshwater fish, which become infected uh, from ingesting those infected crustaceans. The Pericercoid larvae are released from the crustacean and developed into Pluricercoid larvae in the flesh of the second intermediate host. Uh, those minnows or other bottom weeding fish become infected with pluricercoid larvae, uh, are then ingested by predatory fish. This is where the definitive host, the human, becomes infected. The infected undercooked fish, such as a bass, catfish, trout, larger predatory fish, infecting the second intermediate host, then becomes infected by, then becomes ingested by the human the definitive host, and the infected predatory fish with the pluricercoid larvae are released from the fish and develop into immature adult tapeworms inside the definitive host. The immature tapeworm attached to the mucosa of the small intestine by two bilateral grooves, also going back, the bothria, on their scolex, and in the small intestine, the adults produce gravid proglottids, which detach and are passed in the feces to continue the cycle.
Infection with the phylobothrium latum can produce intestinal obstruction um, because of its great size, weight loss, weakness, and this weakness can be attributed to the uh, exploitation of B12 from uh, the, uh, the phylobothrium latum organism. Um, this can result in a macrocytic anemia and eventually, if going on long enough, can cause neurological dysfunction from the chronic B12 deficiency. Uh, if the infection continues long enough, up to 100% of the host's vitamin B12 supply can be exhausted by the Diphylobothrium latum worm. Uh, these infections are usually limited to one adult worm, uh, while numerous other fish-eating mammals can serve as the definitive host. Uh, residents of the Baltic region have a high infection rate. Uh, I've read in some sources up to 100%, which I feel is, is quite high, maybe unreasonably high. Uh, but the Baltic region certainly serves as a high rate of infection. Uh, up to 1 million eggs are released per day per worm. It's quite a large number. Also, going back to the fact that quite a large number of proglottids are found on each worm. Uh, eggs are present in the feces for five to six weeks after infection, which perpetuates, helps perpetuate the life cycle of the phylobothrium latum. This is going to conclude the third presentation on our three-part series, and we will pick it back up with our next class of platyhelminthus, the trematodes.